Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire online video lecture. And today we will cover evolution and we will talk about constant allele frequencies. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, so outcomes for this chapter. Students will be able to state the unit of information of genetics at the evolution level. Define gene pool. List the five processes that cause microevolutionary changes. State the consequence of macroevolutionary change. State the genotypes represented in each part of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Explain the condition necessary for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And explain how the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uses population incident statistics to predict the probability of a particular phenotype. So let's start with defining a population. Now population are interbreeding groups of the same species in a given geographical area. So population are all uh, individuals, right? of the same species that live in a particular area they, that can interbreed. That means they can breed with each other and produce fertile offsprings. Um, gene pool is a collection of all alleles in the members of the population. Now, I want to remind you what alleles are. Alleles are alternative uh, forms of a gene. Um, so, for example, if we have gene, so if you have gene for eye color, that's a gene. But this gene might have multiple alleles. For example, we can have allele for blue eye color, allele for brown eye color, allele for green eye color. It's way more complicated than this. This is just simple representation of what allele is. Because actually your um, eye color depends on the amount of melanin. So it's not like you have, you know, allele for green color. It's just allele that um, enable you to produce less or more melanin. But just to, uh, for purpose of understanding, alleles are alternative forms of a gene. Right, so again, if a gene is a height, how tall you are, then alleles can be tall or short, that will be alleles. Now, we as um, homozygous individuals, right, we are a species who reproduce sexually, right, so we have um, 2N genotype, so you get half of your genome from mom, half from dad, and because you have half of your genome from mom and half from dad, for every gene in your body, you have two alleles. They can be the same or they can be different. And gene pool is a collection of all alleles in the members of the population. Population genetics, study of the genetics of a population and how the alleles vary within uh, or with time. And gene flow is a movement of alleles between populations when people migrate and mate. So uh, frequencies. Thinking about genes at the population level begins by considering frequencies. That is how often a particular gene variant occurs in a particular population. Such frequencies can be calculated for alleles, genotypes, or phenotypes. Many include single base mutation or number of short repeats DNA sequences. Calculating frequencies for single gene trait is fairly simple. The situation becomes more complex with multiple alleles for a single gene because many more phenotypes and genotypes are possible. Different populations have different frequencies of a single gene disease, for example. Caucasian child has a higher risk of carrying a mutant cystic fibrosis allele. The African-American youngster has a higher risk of carrying a beta-globin sickle cell allele. 
right? So when we're talking about frequencies of alleles, right, that's what it says, then when we're looking at different population, then uh, we have different frequencies for, um, for different um, phenotypes. For example, for diseases, that's why some um, population more susceptible to cystic fibrosis, some population more susceptible to sickle cell anemia. Because frequency of uh, mutant alleles that determine different diseases differ within a populations. So over here, you can see the uh, phenotype frequencies. Genetic uh, counselors use phenotype frequency to estimate the risk that an inherited disease will occur in an individual when there is no known family history of the illness. So for example, we live in a population or here in the, um, Northern America, uh, in its south part, Right, so what is uh, so if we know the frequency of disease within our area, so we can predict how likely a newborn will have it. Um, so here the table shows you the disease called PKU, uh, phenylketonuria. It's a condition in which the body can break down amino acid called phenylalanine. Uh, so we can see that in the Chinese, the frequency is one over 16,000, Irish, Scottish, uh, and um, Yemeni Jews, the population is one over 5,000. In Japanese, one is 119,000. In Swedes, one over 30,000. Turks, one in 2,600. In US, Caucasians, one over 10,000. So that's the that's a frequency of that uh, allele that cause, and again, allele is a type of a gene, right? It's a variant of a gene that causes disease. Uh, and it says like in Chinese, for example, uh, when 16,000 kids are born, one will have this um, allele, this broken gene for that disease. So then we can predict what is the probability, uh, how likely uh, kids that are born in a different part of, um, of uh, our uh, planet to have uh, different diseases, genetic conditions. Uh, single allele frequencies in population indicate small step of genetic change called microevolution. So when we have the uh, when allele frequencies change over time within the population, that's what's called microevolution. Factors that change genotypic frequencies include non-random mating, migration, genetic drift, mutation, and natural selection. So um, the definition um, uh, for evolution in a genetic sense is it just evolution is change in allele frequencies within population over time. So, um, so if you look over here, let's say if, for example, so this is a frequency of allele for PKU in uh, US Caucasian, right? One over 10,000. So it stays constant. But when we have change in this allele frequency, we can call it microevolution. Now, why those changes happen? Uh, well, because maybe mutation happen or um, migration of people from area to area. So for example, lots of these people um, from, let's say where they ha have high, from Irish, you see they have, or even Turks, they have high frequency. Maybe lots of these people will move to US and they will bring their allele for PKU, right? And the frequency now in the US, people in, you know, that will, Caucasian will increase. So that's, that's what the factors that can change genetic frequencies. Now, when sufficient microevolutionary changes accumulate to keep two fertile organisms of opposite sexes from producing fertile offspring together, then a new species are formed. So what it says that if you have small changes, within population that we call allele frequency. So when allele frequency changes, 
Those are small changes. But when these changes accumulate, and then we have organisms that cannot breed uh, with each other anymore, or they cannot produce fertile offspring, then we say that the new species evolve. And changes that are great enough to result in speciation, that is formation of new species, are termed macroevolution. Speciation can occur through many small changes over time and or a few changes that greatly affect the phenotype. Right, so um, that that's this changes in a little frequency, small changes in the genes, for example, uh, allowed us to uh, speak when uh, neither of our close relatives, um, orangutans, chimpanzees, they don't have this mutation. Uh, and um, we believe that's why they don't have this ability to speak, right? So small change, small uh, mutation within a gene uh, changes our phenotype, can change our phenotype. And then when we accu accumulate those changes, now we uh, evolve in different species. Now, so how the allele frequencies can be calculated? Well, the first allele frequency equals number of particular allele over the total number of alleles in the population. Uh, count both chromosomes of each individual. Allele frequency frequencies affect the phenotype frequencies. Frequency of two homozygotes and the heterozygous in the population. So if you look at the allele frequency within the population, they are actually going to affect our genotypes. Now, when we're talking about um, genotype, genotype can be homozygous, uh, right? When we have, like, for example, two dominant alleles or two recessive alleles, that's homozygous. Or it can be heterozygous, dominant and recessive allele. Right, so those allele frequency will affect how many homozygous and heterozygous individuals present within a population. Now, how to calculate? So, for example, you have a population. So, if you're looking at population of rabbits that live in a particular area, and you notice that, I don't know, 90% of those rabbits are white, for example, and 10% uh, of those rabbits are uh, gray. So you're looking at phenotype. You have 90% of white rabbits, 10% uh, of gray rabbits, but how to figure out uh, which one of them or how many of them are a homozygous dominant, homozygous recept, uh, recessive, and heterozygous? But actually, there is a way to calculate the number of homozygous and heterozygous individuals within population. And that was um, this method of calculation will, was developed by two scientists, Hardy and Weinberg. And uh, we call it uh, Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. So, developed independently in 1908 by English mathematicians and German physicians, uh, um, they used algebra to explain how allele frequencies predict genotypic and phenotypic frequencies in a population of diploid sexually reproducing species that are us, human, uh, we are diploid and sexually reproducing species. Discover the assumption that dominant traits would become more common while recessive traits would become rarer. Um, so for hardly weimer equilibrium, they use P to represent allele frequency of uh, one allele, and this will be a dominant allele. So dominant um, is represented by P, and Q is allele frequency of a second allele. Usually it's a recessive. Now P plus Q always equals one. So all the allele frequencies together equals one as well. So we have P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared. This also equals one. All the genotype uh, frequencies together equals one. So P squared and Q squared. And frequencies for homozygous 
uh, 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 so that's got frequencies for homozygous and frequencies for uh, heterozygous also will give us one. This is the frequency of heterozygous. Now, this is hardly Weinberg equilibrium over here. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. And P is, uh, let's say P is a dominant allele, right? Let me, uh, let me draw it for us. So P is dominant allele, let's say A, and Q is recessive allele, little a, right? But alleles are not organism, it's not individual. So you and me, we have two alleles for every gene. So P squared gonna be big A, big A, uh, plus two PQ gonna be big A, little a, and Q squared gonna be little a, little a, and that give you one. So within the population, we will have some individuals. So if you're talking about allele uh, A, a, a capital N little case of a gene. So it will be always individuals, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous, right? And the frequencies of them, if you add, so, and you don't have anything else. So you have this, this, and that within the population. So when you add them, that always give you one, right? So that's, um, that's what um, this um, formula tell us. Now let's see how it can be applied. Um, so here's just what we just said. Uh, P squared is homozygous dominant, uh, 2PQ heterozygous, and Q squared is homozygous recessive, and total number of genotype um, is always equals one. All right, so now let's look um, how it related to Pennett squared. So here, for example, we have um, a sperm of the individual that is heterozygous, big A, um, big A little a. And we have all side, uh, big A, little a. So, um, so P multiplied by P give you big A, big A, right? Um, so P multiplied by Q give you big A, little a, right? So P multiplied by Q is a big A, little a. This is again, big A, little a, and here's our uh, homozygous recessive. So you can see we have, uh, let's say, one of these, one of these, and we have two of those, right? So, um, so now let's say giving the P equals frequency of D, normal length of the finger. So let's say that we have a population, and within the population, we measure the lengths of the fingers. Um, so mostly if we measure, so 0.7, so 70% of people within the population will have normal fingers, right? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that, that, I'll take it back. This is the frequency of allele, frequency of allele. So we have a gene, uh, we have a gene that determine um, how long fingers are. So fingers can be long, and they can be short, right? So let me, so long fingers, right? So let's say here's the long fingers and here's the, here's the short fingers. So uh, alleles for a long finger, um, so it's a dominant L, it's present 70% within the population. And for short fingers, um, little L, then the frequency is 30% because we only have two, right? So we're talking about you either have allele dominant or recessive. And we don't have anything else because it's not multiple allele trait. All right, so that's what it says. Now, this is our alleles, but as an individual, you will have two alleles all the time. So over here is actually, oh, D. Let's, let me just keep it D so it's not confusing. So let's say, so D, uh, equals uh, 70%, right? And little d for short finger is 30%. Um, so now look, if we have a people, we will have people with um, homozygous dominant, uh, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous. Now look, this have normal finger and this have normal finger. So you, you cannot see genotype. You're just going to see that 
people have a uh, normal finger or short fingers, right? But now you're gonna calculate the uh, fre uh, genotype frequency. You know that big D, big D, you take this uh, P and you square it. So you put 0.7 square and it give you 0.49. Um, uh, this is going to be uh, 2pq, so you multiply 2 times 0 0.7, 0 0.3, give you 0 0.42, and q squared, uh, 0.3 squared, uh, 0 0.009. So this is our uh, genotype, um, right, those are alleles, but genotype, that tells you that uh, within the population, you will have 49% people that are D, D, uh, 40, 42% people that are big D, little D, it's 90%, right? And you will have um, about 9%, well, here you would say like 10%, because this is, yeah, 9%, yeah, they're right. And 9% of the people that will be little D, little D. Right, so that's that's what this uh, uh, hardly longer equilibrium allow you to do. Right, it allow you to uh, if you know the frequency of allele, it can tell you within the population what percentage of people will be homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive. Right, and then because um, um, we know also gamut uh, frequencies, and when population mates in random, we will say that um, 70 and 30 percent, so 70 percent of people uh, will have a normal fingers and 30 percent will have a short fingers because that's that's all our normal fingers over here. All right, so um, so again, just to not to make it confusing, um, so if you look here again, so if you if you look if you're looking at a population, let's use these fingers as example. So if you're looking at a population and you see people with uh, normal uh, fingers and people with short fingers, now uh, how do you know? Um, how, how do you know that's a phenotype? How would you know the genotype? Well, you would know the genotype because if you know frequency of allele, you can see how many are homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous, right? So, um, so here now we are forming gametes, right? So we are forming gametes um, that uh, uh, male gametes. So over here, you will see that. Uh, we, uh, we actually all D, and this is D and D, right? So you kind of add all the capital Ds, right? This is all Ds. So that gives you a 0.49%. And in this, in normal fingers, you have half of the D, the capital, and half a recessive. So you divide 0 0.42 into half. They give you uh, 0.21, right? So you see over here. So you want to... You want to calculate the frequency of the allele. And you know, okay, here's D, uh, capital, capital, and here, that's a dominant allele. So what is the frequency of dominant allele? Oh, we have this, uh, this 0.49, and you have half of 0.42. So they, you add them, and that's, your, and that's your frequency over here, right? And uh, what is the frequency of... Uh, Recessive, so this is all recessive, so this is 0 0.09, and half of this is also your recessive, so you add and it's give you 0 0.30, right? So, right here, so that's all kind of um, well, it's all ma uh, match, but now some of this will be your um, unknown values, and by knowing um, some, so if you, if you, for example, if this is unknown. If this is unknown, but uh, you know the uh, phenotype, right? You can calculate the frequency of alleles. If frequency unknown and your unknown uh, uh, this genotype, then knowing this frequency, you can calculate the frequency of genotype. So using the formula, you can pretty much just look at the population, 
All right, you, you can look at population of rabbits that we used before and you will see, okay, uh, I have a population of rabbits, 10 of them. Let's take a very small population. And nine of them are white and one is gray. Just looking at the population and knowing which one is dominant, white is dominant over gray, you can calculate and you can predict how many individuals within this population are homozygous uh, dominant, homozygous recessive, and heterozygous. Right, that's what this um, equilibrium is for. All right. So, um, and um, what it says that uh, in the population, allele frequencies stay constant. Um, right, because when we uh, when we take over here possible uh, mate, so let's say we have male um, homozygous dominant and female homozygous dominant. And you calculate the, um, you know, um, that's all the offsprings gonna be homozygous dominant, right? Or you will take like homozygous recessive and all offspring gonna be homozygous recessive. And you take all this possible variation, right? The result of the, um, um, uh, all this uh, mating gonna be constant, right? So um, those alleles, will uh, stay constant within um, gene pool. Allele and genotypic frequencies do not change from one generation to another, right? That's what um, that previous diagram tells us, that uh, the allele frequency within our population stay const constant. That's why this is equilibrium. This is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Rate of protein encoded genes that affect the phenotype. Um, so rare for protein encoding genes that affect uh, the phenotype applies to portion of the genome that do not affect phenotype and includes repeated DNA segments, not subject to a natural selection. So um, the allele frequencies stay constant only for, uh, for a genome that does not affect your phenotype, right? So it's not subject of the natural selection, but every time when this equilibrium is um, changing, when the allele frequencies is changing, then population is evolving. And what it just says over here, that um, in a large population, hardly Weinberg, uh, uh, Weinberg equilibrium, only possible, um, only possible if, we're talking about uh, DNA that does not um, code for proteins. But most of the time, it will be changing. Because look, if you, if you, if you go back over here um, and we say, now what change these frequencies? So we said hardly Weinberg equilibrium tell us that alleles stay constant in the population. However, what can change it? Non-random mating. Do we have non-random uh, non-random mating? Yes, in a, in a animal population, usually we have um, um, we have non-random mating. Why? Because um, you don't go and just um, you know have kids with whoever, right? So you choose your partner. That's what means non-random mating. Migration. Migration always happens because animals uh, always move, right? And we as a people, we always move. Now, genetic drift might not be applied to human populations that much, but mutation constantly happen, natural selection constantly happen. And this, all of this is changing the frequencies of genotype, right? So if frequencies of genotypes um, change constantly, right? That means population evolves, right? So that's that's what it says. So um, that's where we stop, right? Um, so now how we can apply this formula, applying the formula. So if we know is a POQ, we can calculate genotype frequencies such as a carrier risk. For autosomal recessive diseases, the homozygous recessive class is used to determine the frequency of allele in the population. Phenotype indicates a genotype, so we know it, that how we look depends on our genotype. Thus, the value of Q squared can be used to determine carrier probability. 
So let's see how it works in a, um, in a real life example. So the incidence of cystic fibrosis and therefore also a car um, carriers may vary greatly in a different population. So in African-Americans, carrier frequency for cystic fibrosis in, is 1 in 66, in Asian-American in 1 in 150, Caucasian and European descent 1 in 23, Hispanic-Americans 1 in 46. So that's 1 in 66 people is carrier for cystic fibrosis or, or 1 in 150. Now, um, so uh, if cystic fibrosis incidence autosomal recessive class is one over uh, 2000, right? So let's say in um, um, one person, right? One person uh, in 2000 people is carrier for cystic fibrosis. Then you divide one by 2000 gives you 0 0.005. And because the cystic fibrosis Cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. So um, if you have um, gene a, uh, allele A, um, then you know no, no cystic fibrosis, no cystic fibrosis, right? Uh, little a is for cystic fibrosis. Make sense? Now, it says um, they have, if, if somebody has cystic fibrosis, what is uh, his or her genotype? Only little a, little a, right? Because to have cystic fibrosis, if it's a recessive disorder, you need two recessive alleles, right? So now the people who have these two recessive alleles is one in 2000, right? One in 2000. So in little a, little a, it's a Q squared. Remember our formula, P plus two P Q plus Q squared. Now this Q squared is little a, little a. So if you divide one by 2000 and you have this number, you know the Q squared. So if you know Q squared, you can find Q. You just take a, a square root of this number. So that's your Q. If you know Q, you always know P because P equals one minus Q. So your P gonna be this number. And then you know P, you know Q, so you can find your 2PQ, um, right? Because you multiply two times um, um, this number, P, and times a number Q. And that's that's gonna be um, that's gonna be your number over here, 1023. So the carrier, and the carrier is big A literally, is one over 23. Right, so, um, oops, I need to clear all drawings. Uh, so that's how we calculated this for Caucasian or European descent, one in 23, that's the carrier. So again, how do you know it's one over 23? Uh, can you just, you cannot just uh, pretty much take a genetic test of every single individual to know that overall, that's the frequency of carrier. However, you can you know how many people have cystic fibrosis, right? Because these pe people will go to the hospital, they will be um, looking for treatment. So we will have records of people with cystic fibrosis. So if you know how many people have a cystic fibrosis, one in uh, 2000, right? Then using this formula, you can calculate carrier frequencies that are gonna be one over 23. So now if you say like, what is the probability that two unrelated Caucasian will have an affected child? So now if you know that a carrier frequency is one over 23, just in the Caucasian. So what's the probability is that you Caucasian and you marry another Caucasian and your child will have a cystic fibrosis. So probability that both are carrier um, it will be, so the probability that you are a carrier is one over 23, we just calculated. Probability that another person is carrier is also one over 23. So probability that both are carrier is one over, you multiply one over five to nine. Uh, probability that their child has cystic fibrosis is one over uh, four. Now why? I think we have it in the next one. Let, let me see. That's explained. Yeah. Um, no. 
uh, let's me then explain it here. So, uh, so the uh, uh, cystic fibrosis is little a, little a, right? So let's say a parent, one parent is a carrier and another parent is a carrier, right? So that's a carrier and this is a carrier. So um, if you use a pennant square, and it's probability that their child has a cystic fibrosis is right here. So it's one over four, right? One over four. This is where this number came from. Probability that both are carriers is one over 23. Now, how do we know that uh, from the previous calculation? And I will uh, go back to it. So now probability is that um, two Unrelated Caucasian uh, will be um, will have a child with cystic fibrosis. You need to multiply probability that they both are carrier, and as this probability that the child will have little a little a. So when you multiply it, it will be one over two thousand one hundred sixteen, and that's actually exactly what we have over here, right? That we can take from our observations. And this is we calculate using um, the um, role of probability, rule of probability, and Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Right? So now, how it's one over 23, because we can just make observation and see and calculate how many people have a cystic fibrosis. And using the formula, we can find the uh, 2PQ that will be one over 23. Right, so that's our carrier. And then knowing who is a um, carrier, the probability for you to be a carrier or for me to be a carrier and probabilities that the child will have cystic fibrosis, uh, we multiply and we get our um, probability that child will have this disease. So here's um, general US risk among Caucasian for being cystic fibrosis carrier is one over 23 and one over 23. And the risk of offspring having cystic fibrosis if both parents are curious, it's one over four. So we just multiply everything. And that we can um, we can predict that in US and Caucasian population, the uh, probability that two unrelated Caucasian people will have child with cystic fibrosis is one in 2,116 cases, right? Okay, in actuality, however, many single gene diseases are so rare that the Q component of the hardly weinberg equilibrium contributes very little. For such rare diseases of trait, the value of P approaches one. So, um, and again, if we have uh, our formula, uh, P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one, so if you know that this is a very little contribution, so if we can kind of ignore it, then we can say that in the population, we will have um, homozygous dominant, right? And we have, because P squared is big A, little a, and we will have, oh, I'm sorry, big A, big A, sorry. And we have two big A, little a. So the carrier frequency, is approximately twice the frequency of a rare trait. So if you're talking about rare trait, that uh, the um, probability that we are carrier is two times, two times the frequency of this um, rare trait that is few. So we kind of say like um, that's plus this um, will equals, one, right. Um, okay, so anyway, um, let me, all right, so that's, that was our last slide. Uh, and I just wanna remind you that we covered um, the microevolution when we have constant allele frequencies. And these constant allele frequencies are described by um, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. 
right? That is right there. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium right here. And Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, the uh, this equilibrium um, tell us that we can predict within the population how many individuals uh, will have homozygous dominance, uh, will, be, will be homozygous dominant, will be heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. And it's allow us to predict the probability of um, genetic disorders within population, right? Okay, so um, that's it for this lecture. I hope uh, it was helpful and thank you for watching.